let's talk about the future of non-alcoholic drinks. But first, let's think back as recently as 10 years ago. You're at a party, a bar, sitting at a restaurant, you're feeling a little bit thirsty and notice everyone around you is drinking something made with skill or poured with knowledge. You, however, are not drinking alcohol. But instead of flicking through the pages of an exciting new drinks menu, you're directed to a pokey little corner on the first page that highlights a handful of soft drinks, maybe a mocktail or two. Those were the choices. Today, though, it's a different story. Bars and restaurants take pride in crafting their low and no alcohol offerings. Today, it's a different story. Bottle shops carry a great range of bold new spirits, beer, and other alternatives that brim with complex adult flavor, all the while being alcohol free. It may seem like a trend, but there are wider whispers and some shouts of the low and no category being an enormous movement. So what's next for a category that's set to shake up the drinks industry for years to come? Welcome everyone. Sorry about that little tech issue before. My name is Daisy Slade. I'm the new industry lead here at Melbourne Food and Wine Festival and your host in today's industry panel brought to you by Mr. Yum. To pop, to pop the top off this one, we are joined by three individuals from three corners of the industry. Katie Schiff is here. Katie is the general manager at Non, one of the market's leading alcohol alternatives and widely regarded as a game changer for the sector. Hello, Katie Schiff. Hello. <laughs> We're also joined by Anthony Hammond, publican and co-owner of the Victoria Hotel in Footscray and the Builders Arms in Fitzroy. Coincidentally, Anthony is also hosting the much anticipated event the pub with no booze uh, and that event is a part of this year's Melbourne Food and Wine Festival winter program so be sure to get your tickets now. Good afternoon Anthony. Sorry, g'day Katie, how are you love? <laughs> and bringing us a national retail perspective we have Sarah Tenser who is marketing manager of brand and discovery at Dan Murphy's. How are you Sarah? Hey Daisy, good good thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Sarah has been monitoring the category for the last two pivotal years of growth. So Sarah, we are looking forward to tapping into your knowledge and insights in a big way. And I might also just mention that Dan Murphy's is also setting up a non-alcoholic pop-up bar at this year's uh, Welcome to the Jungle event. That's also a part of this, this year's winter program in the Food and Wine Festival. So we are very excited for the non alk events that are coming up next month. Um, now, for all of you playing at home, we would love for this to be a two-way street. So if you've got a question, uh, I know a lot of you are familiar with the chat button telling us that you can hear us. So thank you for that. But if you do have any questions, please just type them in and we would love to have the panellists answer a couple for you. So let's get to it. I would like to sort of return to that introduction and setting the scene. Um, Anthony, you've grown up in and around pubs, but even just 10, 15 years ago, if someone had walked into a venue in Australia and asked for a non-alcoholic drink at the bar, what do you reckon would have been offered to them? The uh, best you would have got was a Coca-Cola or a lemon squash um, or an OJ, um, lemon, lime and bitters in, in pubs. Um, I grew up in pubs in the 70s and the 80s in um, Bendigo, Geelong, etc., and um, it was very much a, a male-dominated, beer-swilling um, idea back then. Um, thank God it's changed a bit, though. But yeah, there, there wasn't much option. There wasn't much option. You know, there was a, a tap of heavy and a tap of light, and the light very rarely got used. Yeah, it's amazing how it's changed so much, and. And Sarah, I guess, Dan, it's, it's one of Australia's, if not Australia's largest alcohol retailer. Mm -hmm. Is Do you think it's fair to say the same could be said for someone walking into a dance who was looking for a non-alcoholic beverage? Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole category and landscape has changed over the last decade. I think the um, health and wellness trend have a big part to play in that, particularly the last couple of years. It's here to stay. It's not a trend. It's very much 
um, what everyone is living and breathing um, and people being a lot more health conscious. Um, and when we talk about health and wellness, it's definitely um, not just physical health, because we've seen that changing landscape across all drinks and consumables, um, not just alcohol. So whether, you know, people are opting for gluten-free, sugar-free, low-carb, low-sugar, you name it, we've got it, um, and people are wanting it. Um, but non-alc specifically is just... Yeah, such a key category at the moment because it taps into both the emotional and physical health um, factors. So, and, and they're so important in today's um, environment, particularly. So, yeah, that's why we've seen it continue to grow, particularly the last couple of years. Yeah. And so, when you say you've seen it grow in the last couple of years, can you share a little bit more info around? like the kind of growth, whether it's, you know, numbers or demographics that you guys have seen and, and particularly um, in your role as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last year alone, um, the non-ALK category at Dan Murphy's has grown 83%, which is just huge and unlike anything we would have ever anticipated. So that's been, um, yeah, really, really exciting to see and, again, shows us that it's here to stay and not just a fad. Um, and yeah, we're really looking forward to leaning into that in the um, next financial year and going even harder and stronger after the category. So we're um, launching um, our biggest ever range with over 200 SKUs um, in this next month. So um, even our range just keeps getting bigger and bigger, which is really exciting for, for people that do want to opt in for, for non-alc drinks and, um, and we've got something for everyone. So um, just the range and offer that's now available and continue, continuing to get a lot of traction um, with, with new and exciting things come on our radar every month is really exciting. Yeah, super exciting. Um, and Anthony, I guess back into the pub side of things, how has your offering grown um, in, in venue? Uh, look, Daisy, I suppose, you know, over the last 12 months when it's really sort of come across across my desk, um, particularly the, the products, um, beer especially, the, the beer products have, have really come a long way since probably five years ago. I think they've nailed the, um, the, the beer. Um, the wine less so, but they will. You know, Nicholas in, um, in France, the, the very famous bottle shop there, um, it's just announced that they're putting in a lot of French um, non-alcoholic wine, which would be Athenia, Athenia to, um, you know, five years ago, the French would have definitely thrown their, you know, thrown their arms up in the air and gone, they're not doing it. But just seeing that now, the, you know, the, the, the Liars products, um, the, your seed lips, um, the, the, the product is now of a certain level that it's acceptable, whereas maybe in the past, especially, you know, what I'd seen was, you know, Clayton's beers and stuff. It was, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't wash your dog with it, um, let alone drink it. So now what we're seeing in, in maybe that traditional area is that the products are, um, are comparable to what the alcoholised products are. And that's bringing a lot more acceptance as well, especially to the older person. Um, you know, similar to what Sarah said, you know, we're seeing a lot of people who, you know, maybe, you know, it might have been in the past they got off the booze for a physical um, benefit, you know, it might have been training for a marathon, it might have been footy season, it might have been cricket season or whatever. But now people are very mindful of their emotional um, and uh, mental state. And I think the last 12 months especially has probably really made people sit back and think about how alcohol affects them and their relationship with alcohol. Um, mm. you know, I've had a fraught relationship with alcohol for many, many years, and I know a lot of people in this industry have. Um, mm. But there was never an alternative or you never saw that there was an alternative. Whereas now, um, you know, as I said, especially with the beer and, you know, things like liars and then, you know, you get onto the stuff like non, which is not a, a replacement, but it's just a really well-crafted, um, and this is not to, to blow smoke, Katie, but, you know, just a really well-crafted um, non-alcoholic beverage that you feel like you're an adult when you're, when you're having it. Um, it's not a can of Coke or a 
you know, a can of soft drink, which, you know, you can have one of them and, you know, you don't really want to have another one really. Mm. So, um, yeah, we're, we're seeing in venue, that's really driven by a younger crowd, um, you know, sort of that 18 to 30. Um, a lot of my staff drink it after work because they mm. just want to have a, a knockoff, but they don't want to, you know, start that craving of six or seven or eight because they've got stuff to do tomorrow or they just mm. don't want to do it, um, you know, and, and that surprises me. A hell of a lot because it's a lot different than when I first started in this industry. So yeah. yeah. And just uh just touching back on Sarah's mention of the growth in Dan's, that 83% growth was over a 12-month period in the financial year ending in 21. So um a really small amount of time to see that kind of growth um and a good, I guess, indicator of what's what's to come. But Thinking maybe let's take a step back and, and understand what exactly has gone into this shifting trend in non-out consumption. And Katie Schiff, I think I may have seen a billboard recently that read complex humans deserve complex alternatives. Uh, it's an extremely clever billboard. I'm not sure who's behind it. <laughs> Let us know. If you know. But um, it does kind of pose a bit of a chicken egg question, I think, where, you know, what came first? Was it a demand for complex non-alcoholic drinks or was it more the industry offering these complex drinks to people saying, you know, this is out here for you to try? Yeah, I mean, we essentially, oh, that's my cat. Perfect timing. Um, <laughs> we uh, started in 2019, I guess, because there have been these complex alternatives out there for a while. There have been, there has been demand, uh, but I think it was very niche demand. And from what we saw um, and from what our founders saw, it was uh, started in that sort of high-end Michelin star, highly gourmet kind of restaurants where a som and a chef or a som or a chef would spend a lot of time developing these really unique flavor profiles from their skills, which were more obviously related to the food world than to the beverage world. Um, and, and instead of, you know, bringing in some uh, a sort of lower end non-alcoholic uh, alternative, they're actually building their own alcohol alternative. So that's kind of where we have seen the demand for our product specifically. But I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that the last year or the last, I mean, couple of years, considering, as Anthony said, we've all been sort of sitting on our bums contemplating our own health, um, that there's been a real kind of uplift in, in people just deciding that they're not really interested in alcohol. Although I think there has been a groundswell for a really long time. I think now it's just reached a peak where, where all of the kind of conditions were right for it to just really take off. And then there's just so much creativity that can then kind of bounce off of that. And I think we're just at the beginning of, of what's going to be a really exciting time for non-alcoholic beverages globally. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess back to Anthony as well, is was that kind of the case in in venues as well? Did you guys see a similar response or push out? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, what Katie said in regards to um, restaurants always did it, have done it well for a longer period of time um, because people were going there for an experience. Now, and whether you were drinking or not, um, you know, it didn't, uh, that wasn't the be all and end all. Whereas I think in um, in pubs, bars, it has very much been the coming and the alcohol is, or, or the, the effect of the alcohol is a primary reason for going. Um, we're seeing a shift with that 100% um, and have for a while again, but <coughs> that, um, that option or, or the offering probably hasn't been around. And now that it has, and it has exploded very quickly, um, that people are taking it up. Um, you know, we've seen just over the last probably two or three months, it increase again. Um, and we've actually got a non-alcoholic list in the Victoria Hotel in Footscray now. Um, and yeah, people are, people are, are not scared to ask for a non-alcoholic option now, whereas in the past they may be had um, mm. especially in a pub where they might go oh 
shit, you know, it's beer and wine and whiskey. You know, they're the alternatives and then it's soft drink. Um, I think by curating it and actually thinking about it and it's, you know, a lot of the products out there aren't just full of sugar, um, aren't sickly sweet, aren't labour intensive for us on our side. Um, you know, that makes it a lot easier as well when you're having to create something from scratch, um, you know, like what they do at Non, they do it for us. So we're lucky we don't have to do that. Um, so that makes it easier to offer that alternative as well. Um, chicken or the egg, I'm not too sure. I think people, the people who, who are after that, who are after a non-alcoholic beverage and a, and a well-crafted one or, you know, a, a nice cold non-alcoholic beer that tastes like beer that they, that they would have drank in the past, um, I think they're just really appreciative of it, you know, really appreciative of it. It's the same as like what Sarah said with the dietary requirements. Um, you know, people in the past who are gluten free would love a palmer um, at the Victoria Hotel Footscray. We did gluten free palmers, um, but the, we have people go, Oh, geez, I hadn't had a palmer in ages because I couldn't. Um, same with gluten free beer, it's going to be the same with, with non alcoholic offerings. You know, well, for whatever pe reason, people don't drink. Um, they still want to be inclusive, be included and feel that they're included um, in social environments. But they also want to feel like they're grown up, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I know if, if I'm out drinking but not wanting to actually drink and out with friends, it's, it's a total game changer now being able to actually feel kind of like you're being just as social and sipping a glass of non rather than just opting for like a lemon lime bitters. Yeah. Um, I think that's um, but, the, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, Daisy, that's probably the um, most important thing um, to, to factor in when we're talking about the customer demand because, I mean, particularly in a Dan sense, we're very rarely talking about people that totally abstain from alcohol, right? Um, it actually is mm. this the, the people that want to moderate and, um, want to swap out for alternative non-alc drinks, whether it be through an evening to moderate their alcohol content throughout an evening, throughout a week, and swapping out um, for a midweek um, drink, non-alc drink, as opposed to and keeping alcohol for the weekends, or whether it be taking part in a whole month in dry July um, and actually doing it as part of a bit of a challenge. There's so many different reasons mm -hmm. um, why people moderate um, with that underlying factor of, you know, that um, health and wellness that I spoke about before. But um, I mean, particularly at dance, it's not like we would normally get people that are non-drinkers walking into dance. So we're gonna get people that like alcohol, like the aspect of food and drink, they do come hand in hand. Katie was saying it perfectly where it is so, so much a part of Australian culture and mm -hmm. social aspect and how we um, engage with friends and family. It's always centered around food and drink. and you know, it's it's a balance act between health and wellness, but people still wanting um, to enjoy the finer things in life and those social aspects, and um, not wanting to forgo um, forgo that experience. So, it, yeah, non-alcoholic drinks provide such a great and unique way to still um, feel like you're not missing out, uh, which I think is yeah really key as to how we position it um, in the market as as a great alternative to enjoy how you'd normally enjoy. Um, your normal food and drink um, pairing or social activities um, without um, the actual alcoholic content. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's the that's how we kind of look at that that customer demand and what our customers are saying to us as to how they're actually wanting to engage with the the category. Yeah, and with your customers, Sarah, is it is there kind of a leaning demographic? Is it more female based or more male skewed or does it vary you know men drink more non-alcoholic beers as opposed to women looking for you know a, a non-type of you know alcohol alternative that's perhaps yeah. a little more light <laughs> um it is pretty um well split across the board i mean um obviously um pregnant um, females um, benefit greatly from the alcoholic ranges. Again, going back to um, health benefits and why people might choose to opt for 
not non-alcoholic drinks, but it's the it's the greater trend that we're seeing, not just opting for non-alcoholic drinks, but actually we're seeing um, people drinking less across the board, but drinking better and still wanting that premium experience that I spoke about. So the actual liquid consumption also coming down as well as those swaps and alternatives um, outside of alcohol drinks. So it is a, it's a, it's much bigger picture, but people are still, as I mentioned, wanting to have that same level of experience and enjoyment and actually might be opting for a more premium experience and whether they do still want to drink alcohol, but they'll only drink one glass of a more expensive wine or, um, as I said, opt for a non-alcoholic drink as opposed to, yeah, can of Coke to, to Anthony's point, because it is, again, that more premium experience and, and the connotations that come with that social aspect or winding down or enjoying a nice meal is still um, very much what people look for. Mm. And, and back to that point of, I guess, the the complexity of the drinks and, and Anthony mentioned how, you know, it's not labor intensive for them, um, equally satisfactory pouring a glass of non for their customers. Katie, what does it actually take to make a bottle of non? Uh, uh, it takes a lot, um, <laughs> depending on the products, I guess. Uh, the thing about non-alcoholic beverages in general is there, there's sort of, it's an industry where we've had to really come up with different ways of doing things. And some of it is, you know, like non-alcoholic wine, which is de-alcoholized wine. So it's wine that's been made as alcohol and then through a process of de-alcoholization is, is, has had all the alcohol taken out of it. Um, similarly with beer, um, we kind of see ourselves as a, as a fourth category. If you've got beer, wine and spirits, then you've kind of got non. And we decided to, just because we're crazy, um, go out on a limb and completely engineer a completely new way of doing everything. So they're our newest uh, product, which was just released a few weeks ago, um, which has stewed cherries and coffee in it, takes, I think, eight days to make and we produce on a monthly basis. So that is significant time out of our month that we're spending producing. And then we're using, I mean, oh, cat again, sorry. Um, <laughs> We're using. Um, Just it on the screen. Oh God! Uh, I think it was 500 kilos of cherries for our first batch, which was a smaller batch as well. And then having to roast them uh, with all of the spices that are in there, in our uh, 50 kilo oven. So that was quite a few turns in the oven in order to get through. Um, and then other skews. Sorry, it's raining really hard, so I'm not sure if you can hear me. But. Um, other skews as well, like um, our caramelized pear takes a ton of pears every month as well. And so we're rotating pears in and out of the oven. And then we have a hot extraction, cold extraction, and then all of the flavors um, are kind of combined in a big tank. So for each product, you're looking at days on end to uh, produce about 10,000 liters at a time. Um, so there's a lot of work involved. And then when you think about the engineering with regards to how the hell do we actually make it um how do we filter it you know how do we make sure that it's it's clean to drink you know and that it's not going to grow anything in the bottle um it's it's a pretty amazing process and it's very fun to get the r&d team pop something in front of you and, and you get to taste it every time but um it's it's a lot of creativity and it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of uh trial and error um particularly with non yeah yeah. it's it pays off though the uh I haven't actually tried the coffee and cherry yet but my brother tasted it on the weekend and he was like it's the best first one they've done yet so keep keep the experimenting coming I but can't, um that, I can't be biased but I also <laughs> no he's definitely not biased I can tell you there would be <laughs> very honest conversations to be had if he mm -hmm. didn't like it but um that kind of labor intensiveness is that, I guess that kind of helps justify, well, not justify, but explain the, the $30 price tag that some people may be questioning that comes with a bottle of non? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in the same way that you get a range of, of price points for all alcohols, you've got your sort of lower end to your higher end wines, beers and spirits. It's the same with non-alcoholic products as well. So we, because of the work involved and, and um and because we're really a drink to be to be um, enjoyed with food and and really food focused um, uh, beverage, we yeah 
tend to kind of be in the higher price point for relative to the other products in the category. Um, but yeah, that is to do mostly with just the amount of effort that's behind it, as well as, you know, um, making sure that it's it's consistently super high quality all the time. So yeah, I mean, you just have to think of it in the same way as you would any other um, any other beverage. There's always going to be something for everyone and, and you know, no shade to all the other alcohol alternatives out there as well. And uh, in terms of, I guess, price pushback in venue or, or in store, Sarah and Anthony, do you guys have to deal with that on a regular basis or semi-regular basis at all? I'll let you go, Sarah, first. Um, I mean, yeah, to Katie's point, I do think there's still um, a lot of uh, industry education to do and um, get people understanding the processes behind making non-alcoholic drinks and the actual alcoholic content not being the reason for a price tag on alcoholic drinks across the range. It's actually um, the effort that goes into it. And in most cases, the effort that goes into a non-alcoholic drink is even more than an alcoholic drink, right? Because it's um, you're going that extra step to, to create that same great taste um, with that great quality, um, but removing, um, you know, and quite an important factor of that taste. So um, there is a long way to go in terms of the education of, yeah, why they are expensive and to Katie's point, why there's a range of um, price points as well, because it is just like any other um, product or bottle of wine um, with that sort of raw ranging price um, uh, price shift um, that we have in store. And um, again, again, across different sorts of categories, whether it be beer, wine, spirits, or even this sort of new wave category that, that Katie um, is playing in with non, uh, where it's, you know, not identifying with either of those categories, um, which is just takes on a whole new world of itself. And, um, and I think it, um, shouldn't go without saying that the reason why you buy nice wine is because of the craftsmanship and, and, um, and, and, you know, strong love that those producers put into those bottles of wine. It goes for the exact same thing for, for non-alcoholic drinks, but I think there's a, there's a big um, way to go with the, with the industry and customers on that one. Yeah. I'm, I, I, sorry, Daisy. No, sorry. I was just trying to guide you in. Go for it. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I, I agree with you, Sarah. I think um, the, the the older consumer that I see, they you know they're not going to drink it, but they'll they'll look at it and I go, oh, geez, that's expensive. It's got no booze in it. Um, I know, even you know, on my behalf, when I first started looking at this world, um, you know, you're sort of trying to substantiate to yourself where it was sort on a on a wine list or on a beverage list, and you know, how does it look? when you, you know, for, for the customer. Um, I actually sat down, had a conversation with my manager, Matthew, about this not long ago. And I think what, what you've got to look at from my perspective is that the customers that are coming in and drinking these products, um, it's not necessarily a financial reasoning. Um, that they're drinking non-alcoholic products. I, I wouldn't think it's a financial reasoning at all. Um, they're doing it for their own reasons. And, and, you know, as Sarah said, there are many and they are varied for lots of different mm -hmm. people. So, you know, for them, it's not necessarily a financial um, decision. What they're doing is they're looking at it from an enjoyment position, I think, especially when you're looking in venue. And also, you know, from takeaway, um, you know, from off-licence off as well, People want to be included with their mates at the barbecue. Mm -hmm. That's having a, you know, and if you look at the packaging of these, um, of especially the non-alcoholic beer, I'm just looking at a few of them now, they're cool. They look like craft mm -hmm. beer because um, they are craft beer. And I think that's one of the things we've had to sort of educate some people on. And it's generally the people over the bar that, as I said, are never going to drink it anyway. But they're sort of, oh, why is that expensive? And so, well, because it's a craft beer. It is actually a craft beer. It's not a... A soft drink um, and like what Katie said the products that they're putting into these um, into these beverages <clears throat> are high quality so you've got to charge for it um, they've got to charge me for it and I've got to charge you for it so you know there's 
it's, it's basic economics in that respect. Um, but the people, again, you know, the people that are drinking this are so appreciative. And I've had so many people, um, I know one of them is actually listening to this now, Amy Armstrong. Um, you know, she's been so appreciative when she's come in venue. Sorry, my phone's going off. When she's come in venue because you're actually making an effort to um, provide what a lot of people aren't. Um, you know, I'm sure that there will be cheap very cheap um, non-alcoholic products come out um, and that's fine. That'll be the same as there is, you know, very cheap wine or very cheap beer. Um, I think at the moment that the cost is probably um, substantiated um, in the product um, at the moment. Um, whether or not that continues, I don't know, but, you know, we're sort of looking at about, I think it's about six fifty or $7 for uh, our entry-level can of beer. Um, non-alcoholic at the pub. Um, I've seen it ten bucks in the city. You know, heaps normal for ten bucks. People pay it if if you you know. So um, I don't think the cost has got a lot to do for the consumer um, in venue. I think they've made that decision already. Um, but you've got to be fair and reasonable with it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, one of our viewers, listeners, um, has just typed in Katie Fry and she she said that they're making a lower alcohol and, and non-alcoholic spirit of the same infusions and it's far more labour intensive and costs a lot more in botanicals to make the non than the alcoholic version. So, yeah, I think it's really about bringing up that education piece for the consumer if there is any kind of pushback and just making them aware of what's actually going into the drink, I think. Mm. Sarah, maybe that can be the next dance campaign. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, again, yeah, we see it. Um, I mean, we we get our key spikes for, for the category around key occasions where people are likely to trade up um, and we often see them buying higher price liquids. So, you know, your Christmases and Easter's and, and the like. So, um, yeah, I, I do hope to see that. Um, and I do expect it to, be, to become more mainstream and more accepted for um, outside of occasion as well and, and your more everyday drinking just as um, you normally would with alcoholic drinks as well. So um, particularly the, the new wave um, and new format wines, just going back to that, um, that conversation, I think that that's a really interesting space because it helps, again, set it apart from what people expect from a non-alcoholic drink because it's not your beer, wine and spirits without the alcohol. It's actually a whole new complex drink. And um, where, you know, that's still very new in terms of our product offering, what, what's available on the market. But um, I mean, again, just to throw um, a couple of, of stats out there, um, that is the, that's the fastest growing for sure. So beer and wine, whilst they take up um, still the majority of our sales um, in the non-alc category, um, the spirits category alone, let me have a look at my notes. Um, the the non-alc spirits category alone in that in that F21 12 month period was actually up 136 percent um, above um, above the the wider category being at about 80 percent. Um, and the premix alone, which we define as a lot of this new wave, new format, 968 percent. Like that's just insane. That's the, like ready to serve, ready to drink. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the more alternative that doesn't fit into your, your beer, wine and spirits. So it's just, um, yeah, it's a really exciting space. And, um, and I think something that um, will help educate the customer on, on this offering and that it doesn't have to fit into what they think is beer, wine and spirits. It mm -hmm. can be a whole new range of drinks to experience and explore that just, as I mentioned, has that same level of passion and craftsmanship as, as the alcohol. Mm. And um, Anthony, I know when. Oh, yeah, Sorry. Sarah. I was just going to ask a quick question from Sarah, yeah. um, just because she's working for a big company and they're very good at crunching numbers and generally have a lot of stats. Do you have um, sort of, and this is you know, a question without notice, do you have any sort of um, idea of, of, the, of the percentage of people that are identifying as non drinkers or, or you know, that sober curious idea? Um, we we don't. The, the only um, data and customer insights that we're pulling is that 
they're all current dance customers that do buy alcohol um, quite often and more often than, than non-alc drinks. So they um, they dapple in non-alc, whether it be for a particular occasion. So whether they're self-consuming or, Anthony, I loved your point before about just creating that inclusive environment with, like you would for a pub or um, in a bar environment. Um, I, I, I do believe a lot of people are starting to make sure they have that inclusive environment at home for any sort of occasions or dinner parties as well. So whether they're um, yeah, purely self-consuming and, and moderating um, their alcohol intake with non-alcoholic drinks or whether um, they're buying it for, for gifts or key occasions to share, um, I, I don't have that level of insight, but I know that um, they, they're, they're not exclusive to non-alcohol. Yeah. I, I, I'm finding, and you know, the more people that I'm speaking to and the more that we're seeing, um, you know, the interaction with customers and stuff, a lot of it is that it is a mix and match idea. You know, um, people are moderating their, you know, they may be driving, they, you know, um, and also instead of just saying, well, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna have mineral water because I've got to take the kids to footy in the morning at 7.30 and it's gonna be freezing. They'll have a couple of non-alcoholic drinks or they might have a non-alcoholic drink and a glass of wine, etc. So I think it's, I think it's um, very important um, you know, to, to realise that as well. It, it's not a, a total teetotal idea. Mm -hmm. um, what it is, is, is people are, are using it in all, in all different ways and all different manners um, so, that, so that they are enjoying themselves. Yeah, and enjoying that same experience that drinks has. I think, um, yes, yeah, spirits being a new, quite a new category and, and we're seeing more R&D in this space. Um, people are loving the actual cocktail making experience as well because, again, it's similar to what they know and love and, and what, they, what they've experienced before and get to have that fancy sort of experience like you would normally um, but without the alcohol. Whole. So I think, um, yeah, particularly as I mentioned in that new wave spirits and premix um, sector, I think it's it's going to be a really exciting space to watch. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, even um, one of our viewers as well as commented, Brian um, has just mentioned that the latest IWRS global report found self and at home consumption to be the largest non out consumption um, at sixty eight percent of all occasions so that kind of taking it home making it yourself thing is is really growing and that kind of leads me to my next question um Anthony which when we briefly spoke last week um I mean it's great to see the consumer really shifting trends and, and consumption um ideas but we kind of briefly mentioned there was maybe perhaps a bit of a pushback from the industry um can you elaborate a little bit more on that for us yeah, look, I think um, my experience with it, and and it was my, it was me as well. You know, I've got to be, um, I've got to readily admit that. Um, I would go, oh bullshit! Like, hmm. One alcoholic beer, piss off. See you later. Um, if anyone tried to sell it to me, you know, so because I thought it was garbage. Mm -hmm. um, now, look, I've got to be very, um, I've got to be very honest with you. The, I'm lucky that probably we got some sober and some naught put in front of us first up as opposed to another couple of brands that is mass produced um, that I've tried and are, are not great. Um, and so, you know, I think the resistance in, in the industry and, you know, if you look at, at the industry, um, at the, at the pub industry especially, um, we're very set in our ways. Um, mm. We're generally, um, and it's on one of them. So you know, generally, white male, forty-five plus, um, who have got an idea of what a pub is, and that is drinking heavily, um, watching a footy um, when you could smoke inside, smoking darts, and you know, button them on the on the ground. Um, that's not the way the industry is anymore. The industry, um, you know, now we have to evolve. Um, that's the reason I asked sort of Sarah about if she had any numbers because I have heard some and they they were initially sounded really high to me, mm -hmm. but 
you know, it's somewhere above 20%. Um, apparently, 18 to 35 year olds identify as non drinkers. Um, to me, that says to me that um, they're my customers or my next lot of customers. So I've really got to engage with what they're doing. Um, and, you know, it's, if I don't, the, the, the Great Aussie pub will die. And it nearly did, I reckon, 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago. I, there's been a resurgence in it now. But, you know, to keep the idea of what, if, when I was brought up, even though it was a very hard drinking, um, male dominated public bar, it was a labour exchange. It was where you would meet up with your friends. It was the social um, outlet, especially when you're talking country towns, where everyone would come together, um, where the footy club would meet, the netball club would meet, the, you'd go there after tennis. Um, you know, the kids would run around in the front bar. So I want to continue the idea of, that, of the pub being that social melting pot. And I think it's very important to understand as well that <clears throat> the way that you know the same thing gluten-free vegetarian etc people's diets change um and dietary requirements change their relationship with alcohol is changing so instead of it being just you know that's bullshit and being closed-minded that's not very inclusive mm. So when you're being inclusive, that means, you know, sexual orientation, religion, race, what you, you know, vegetarian, vegan, not, don't drink alcohol, whatever it might be. People at Evan Barrick for Collingwood, you know, we won't, we won't, you know, ostracise them um, or Carlton. Um, so, you know, it's about making a safe and inviting place where people can come and be themselves mm. without having to question what they're doing or have people question what they're doing? Well, why aren't you drinking? That's my decision, it's not yours. It's got nothing to do with you. Um, you know, I've sort of said to, to Daisy, I've, you know, I've, I've had a fraught relationship with, with, with alcohol. I really love the taste of beer. Now, if I'm not drinking, the taste of beer, you know, on a hot day, I'll be, you know, it's, there's nothing better than the taste of beer on a hot day, but, if there's not that alternative and you feel that someone's going to look at you funny because you've, you've asked for that in venue, you're not going to ask for it. Mm. And you're going to feel bad about why you're doing it. It might be that you're, you're having an, an issue with alcohol. It might be that you're training for a marathon. It might be that your wife's, pre you know, being a male, your wife's pregnant and you're doing this to make her pregnancy easier because she can't drink, so you're going to not do the same thing. Um, there's a myriad of different reasons. What I would like, love it to get to the point of, and I've been pushing some, um, you know, some of the local producers here, um, beer-wise, is to get it on tap so mm. that it's even more normal. Mm. Um, you know, Katie's going to get some non on tap for me um, that we're going to have at the pub. Um, at the builders, we've got uh, Monso Kombucha on tap. Um, mm. You know, to me, this is the next evolution. Of, of what the pubs are becoming um you know before the Neuenhauser report you couldn't in 84 you couldn't get a beer or you, you couldn't just have a drink anywhere you had to be in a pub otherwise you had to eat um you know then it started to evolve into pubs had better dining rooms you know so the food got better in pubs um you know then all of a sudden pubs went backwards because a lot of pokies went into them so that sort of that sort of cut, cut a lot of people off the knees now we're getting back to the pub being a nice, beautiful, inclusive environment where everyone can come to. Mm. And this is just the next part of it, you know. Um, as I said, the same with dietaries and all that sort of thing. Mm. Who cares why, you know, why you don't eat gluten? It's not got nothing to do with me. Um, so, you know, to me, that, that's the resistance has, is from people that I was one of up until a short period of time ago, you know, 12 to 18 months ago. Can I sort of chime in as a punter? Sorry. Just yes. recently, I, I went a week without drinking. I, I like a drink and, and my partner's quite a heavy drinker and we go to the pub often. Um, but I thought I'm just going to try a week without 
you know, alcohol properly. And I went to a few different places and I had a few different experiences and it was really interesting to see people's reaction. And some, depending on where you are, you know, you've got people who embrace it, like at the Vic, you know, there's a whole non-alcoholic list, you know, and other places where people are just, it's still very much a stigma and, and it takes, you know, enough confidence to kind of push through, even though some places might be listing non-alcoholic beverages as well, like non and other things, they still kind of laugh at you for having ordered it and, and not knowing that I'm associated with non at all. And I think that we are going to reach a critical point. And I think that it's soon in, uh, obviously in uh, the cities, I, I've been noticing in the Q&A, there's a couple of people in the country who are having a hard time with it, you know, but the country will follow suit soon enough. And I just think the more people who are actually asking for it and demanding it and, and not worrying about being laughed out of the pub, you know, and actually being able to say, look, there's, there's a significant increase in people drinking non-alcoholic beverages. And here's a couple of stats if you're interested, but you're going to find more and more people drinking it. I think that's where the critical mass is going to tip into normalization. And I really do think it's just a matter of time. Yeah. I think with that, Katie, as well, um, once venues understand that there is the demand, like they can see it and, you know, as I said, we've been doing it for the, you know, 12 months now and the demand that we've seen increase, I want to expand what I'm doing, not mm. decrease it. Um, and it's driving new people to your business. You know, when we're talking as, as an industry forum, it's driving people to your business. I went out with a girl many years ago who was a vegetarian. And she said to me, this is just after we brought the builders. She said to me that vegetarians will actually say where your group of people will go because there was, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was still a small, um, you know, a small offering on most, on most pub menus. And that sort of really stuck with me that, yeah, if there's only one or two things that they can have. It's pretty boring for them. So they, they'll just say to their friends, oh, could we go somewhere else? Mm. The, the offering for you is still as good, but there's a much better offering for me. Now, that will happen with people that aren't drinking or that, you know, that don't want to drink for that night or for that week or for whatever. They'll go, oh, you know what? There's actually nothing there for me. Mm. Do you mind if we go around the corner? And if they're mm. true, they'll just go, yeah, cool. Not a problem. Let's go around there. Yeah. Um, I used to always look at, at wine lists and because um, I was into um, Lone Avention wine and had been for a long period of time. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me, folks. I'm just on a... <laughs> um, sorry. Kicked myself. Yeah. Um, and, and I would sort of sit there and look at where, at that list to see if I wanted to go there. Um, People do it. So as an industry, we've got to embrace that because it's only going to bring people, more people into your venue. And it's only going to want, it's only going to make you more inclusive and it, people will come back for it. Mm. We see it. We see yeah. it, people coming back for it. Um, and it's bringing more consumers to your door. You know, the same with Dan's, you know, like if you didn't have that offering, um, and people wanted it and was coming, it was in a in small independence only. Well, it's not going to break Dan Murphy's, but you're missing out on that consumer, aren't you? Or the consumer's got to go to two places. Shit, I need to get some, alcohol, some non alcoholic beer for Anthony, and I've got to get some um, alcoholic beer for Katie. Mm -hmm. But we'll just go between the two. You know what I mean? Um, so I think by not embracing it, they're actually, people are doing a disservice to themselves in, their, in venue. Yeah, absolutely. I think that vegetarian um, comparison is just so perfectly spot on. And it is like a lot of my friends are um, not drinking, you know, they're either breastfeeding or pregnant. And it really does dictate where you go when you're catching up. Um, and I think it, yeah, it will be definitely kind of lead that way of where are we, where are we going? Where does everyone, where can everyone's needs be satisfied? And also, where can we split the bill evenly? Just, yeah, just like there's um, vegan restaurants, they're non 
bars completely non-alc are going to start taking off for sure. And we've already seen it here in Melbourne. Um, you mentioned yeah. before, um, you know, Dan Murphy's, it sounds like the most anti-Dan Murphy's thing to do, but doing a non-alc bar um, at, um, yeah, Welcome to the Jungle for MFWF. Um, just really, I think it's going to take um, some key industry leaders just to be really bold and own the space and, um, destigmatize it to Katie's point and um, and I think we've got the right offer the right range and in yeah even more craft and local um, producers coming on board the trend as well which I think will just make it all the more exciting to participate in and um, and yet more open for everyone yeah absolutely and um, I guess you know there's the growth in the market, the like growing acceptance from the consumer, it's it's huge. And I think it it's, doesn't really show any sign of slowing down. But, um, you know, if I'm here listening today for all our viewers and, and thinking about starting my, no, my own non-elf brand, whether it's a beer, a wine or a ready to, ready to drink or just a, an alcohol alternative, do you guys think there's still, still room for me in the Esky? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. And a healthy competition, Katie. Yeah. Oh, man, it's just the beginning. I mean, even at non, there's so much creativity going around and I can only imagine, you know, that's only with the five of us. And, you know, there are so many people out there who I think are recognising that this is a thing. And, yeah, I mean, we're always stronger together. I, I was on another panel recently with guys from Liars who actually, I think Dave Murphy is on this uh call as well potentially but who also okay. has some good data if he wants to share it but um yeah I mean we're stronger together and we're always going to be able to push for a larger market share you know on premises obviously but also I mean I just can't wait to see what else comes yeah. um because it's really even in the last year it's it's increased so significantly so yes Daisy please yeah. some. I'll drink it okay <laughs> you'll be hearing from me no. Um, no, but it is interesting. I mean, like Four Pillars has only been around for what, like eight years and now there's hundreds of craft gin distilleries in Victoria, let alone the world. So um, it'll be very interesting to see what, what the growth looks like in this category um, locally and internationally. Um, but I actually think we might have to start drawing this forum to a close. So I guess what I'd like from each of you um, would be some key takeaways on the non-alc movement. What do you guys think is next for the category? Oh. Katie, would you like to start? <laughs> <Or> Anthony? <laughs> Whoever. <laughs> Anthony wants to go first. Go on, Anthony. I think that the, um, the, 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 the quality of the product will just keep improving. Um, you know, I think especially in the wine sector of it. Um, I also think that, you know, from my respect and, and what I'm seeing in, in venue is the stigma is slowly going. Um, mm. You know, as Katie said, you know, you've nearly got to push through it um, sometimes, mm. but the stigma is slowly going. Um, and I'm seeing it, I am seeing it more and more with blokes my age, you know, 45 plus, who are just sort of, they're a bit more in touch with, you know, with where they're at, um, still love a beer, but they know that they can't probably drink as much as what they used to and still function and do what they need to. And also as you get a little bit older, you put a little bit more weight on the more you drink. So, you know, I know quite a few guys have sort of looked at that, um, but I, I think the quality will, get, will, will increase across the board. Um, and the acceptance, especially, um, well, hopefully by the people, you know, the people running the venues because we can be very, um, we can be very narrow-minded at times. And I think once people start to open up to it, um, you know, the sky's the limit for, the, for, for, this, for this area, I reckon, um, you know, and Sarah would be able to say that over, you know, the, the off-premise stuff, but no, I think on-premise is only just starting. We're only just scratching the surface of it. Katie or Sarah? Yeah, I'll go next. <laughs> um, I, I just, I mean, not saying anything that hasn't been said already, but I, um, key takeaways are really just 
it's only a matter of time before we kind of take over a really good portion um, of, of the industry. And I think that's only a great thing, obviously, for public health, um, as well as, you know, for the industry in general. Um, and for mental health, you know, I think I've been speaking recently to um, a music agency, and, and there are not for profits that deal with sobriety and music specifically, but there are so many areas where this actually touches um, that I think it's it's going to be more and more prominent. And um, I think it, my main thing is just, you just have to try what's out there. Um, I think one of the hardest things for us at NON is, is because we are so different to everything else, it's, it, it, that's what's so exciting about it, but it's also what's the most difficult about it. And it's just about encouraging people to give something a shot. And, you know, it mm. might be weird and you might think it's, you know, strange, but at the end of the day, there's so much out there to try and, and, and there's so many people doing so many interesting things and it's worth just, you know, having a sip, going to a tasting, taking a punt on, on a bottle and, and giving it a shot. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, to close out from, um, from my key takeaways and what I'm seeing over the last couple of years, um, definitely not a fad, not a trend. It's, it's here to stay and, and to Katie's point, um, only get bigger and start to um, take on the whole alcohol industry. It's um, it's a really exciting time. I There's still going to be so much new product emerging over the next even 12 months, which I'm just so excited to start seeing, particularly in, um, you know, it has, it has been, you know, a lot of the big commercial um, uh, companies and businesses that have driven a lot of the R&D, but now that it is becoming more mainstream, um, really excited to start seeing more local and smaller producers get behind it. Um, I think anyone would be crazy currently in the alcohol industry not to get on board because um, it's just not the way of the future. And then, you know, we'd be um, yeah, denying ourselves, um, you know, future growth opportunities if, if we thought it was um, a fad and, um, and, and something that will go away. So, yeah, I'm personally really excited to continue to learn about the, the new products and the new um, product development that a lot of the producers can pull together and, um, and see where it goes. And, yeah, gone are the days of OJ or lemonade as your options and, and watch out kombucha. I think that's also where kombucha got a lot of their success from because they were starting to bridge that gap of um, an interesting drink, not cheap. Um, and, you know, we saw that grow enormously in the last five years. So I think we're going to take on kombucha now. Um, and I, I mean, I'd like to see and I, I would hope to see a replica for every single alcoholic drink that is currently available, um, if not even more exciting new drinks that we have never thought be possible with alcohol drinks. So it's a pretty, yeah, pretty exciting new venture and um, big horizon, I think, for us all. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that I've kind of taken away is for certain is it's it's really a great time to to be a drinker of anything, but particularly when looking for alcohol alternatives. Um, and I think it's quite exciting as well to kind of be taking back the term like let's go for a drink from alcohol um so a good time to be in, in the non-alc industry and yeah thank you again katie schiff anthony hammond and sarah tensor you three have been brilliant i'll also take this opportunity to thank our forum partners mr young once more and mention to all of you watching that our winter edition with melbourne food and wine festival served to you by Bank of Melbourne is coming up on the 20th of August and tickets on sale now. And that does include Anthony's The Pub With No Booze event, where you can even sample a few glasses of non, I believe, and also Dan Murphy's non-alc shop at our Welcome to the Jungle event. Um, so whatever your beverage of choice, we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, Daisy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.